You know what, I decided to rename the entire portion of this to Part 5A, B, and C, so I apologize. Even though this technically would be Part 7, quote-unquote, this is Part 5C of the Minnesota Fats commentary. So, yeah, I apologize for the, uh, the very obscure renaming, but trust me, I have my reasons. So we're, uh, we're at the end of the single pocket run, and we're duking it out with Susan Short. Let's see how many balls are sinking on this one. Oh, that did not do anything. Why did I do that? Why did I jump? Why did I jump there? That was oh right. I wanted uh, yeah. I want to see where she scatters the balls. Oh, that kind of looks like a lotus there. I mean, lotus. <laughs> Peony. Not sure. Um, because uh, you might know what I'm talking about. In Fandavision, there's kind of like this flower style, um, yeah, there's kind of like this flower art style flare that you can destroy, and it looks just like that. It's like a, um, yeah, it's like um, a dot with like six other dots f going around it, just like a regular flower. I'm not sure which flower that is, though. Either way. Either way, it's a nice depiction. It's a nice depiction of a flower in a pool game. I wonder who Susan Short is based off of, because uh, I don't think that whoever is in this game is, um... Because I, I, I know that a good amount of the people in, uh, the, in the Genesis version, I don't know if they're actually based on... Um, actual people from the team. I know, uh, as I've mentioned before, the Saturn version has people based on the development team of Data East, um, but I don't know at all about this about this version's development. This version's development had a slightly different team as opposed to the Saturn release, so I can't really do proper compare and contrast as a result. So whether or not Susan Short is an actual person is well beyond my knowledge. Hmm. Now, if Susan does this correct, she could literally fire the four into her pocket. Does she do it? I don't think she does. Does she? Hmm. Down and easy. Nope, she's not going for that. She's going for the ten. Or the three, in this case. No, she decided that... She decided to do something completely different. <laughs> Susan, you just gave me the ultimate opportunity to sink in a ball that I normally wouldn't sink in otherwise. Okay. Or not. Um, that was probably a bad move on my part. I probably just wanted to give myself more options because I knew that if I pocketed one ball and then tried to pocket another, they probably would have turned out into a bad um, end result, so I guess that's reasonable, but who knows. Who knows? It's all in the angles, it's all in the power, and it's all in how you do the shot. One false move could duck up your game. You know, I kind of like that the um, the pool legend portion of the Minnesota Fats logo appears to um, shine uh, for a bit, so that it doesn't feel as if the whole um, upper portion of the menu, I mean menu of the heads-up display is just um, too plastic or flat. In fact, I love how everything is well shaded and shiny in this. This is rather uncommon for a um, for a video game of the time, but then again, this is 1995, so I guess I can't judge that. I can't judge the thought of that. Because, I mean, by the time we reached 1995, 1996, um, we already had established the way that the, uh, the Genesis and the Mega Drive would go in terms of graphical quality. It would only get better and better over time. 
And in terms of this title, I would say it definitely does deliver. I mean, okay, sure, yes, it's, yes, we're playing the same game that we played three years prior with the 1992 Port Aside Pocket. But, I mean, this is basically that game optimized. And, uh, you know, in terms of modern era games, and I'm, I'm not just referring to ROM hacks, but I mean just like games in general. I feel that if you're gonna deliver to us a game with um, with uh, bad physics or whatever, and then make a sequel using the same uh, source based on the same source code, but completely bug fixed and with better physics and whatnot, as well as features and other and other things that people wouldn't normally look for, or that people would normally look for, I must say. Why not just wait? Why not just wait on the first game until it's been optimized? You won't have to optimize it further after that. And I, and that is why I feel that every single every single other pool game made by Data East after Side Pocket Two became a success just solely because of the fact that those particular titles already were optimized already. Because, you know, when, you know, after Minnesota Fats Pool Legend, you know, we had the Saturn version of Side Pocket 2, which optimized the game even more. Then you had Voice Idol Collection um, Pool Bar Story, which, in it, or is it Voice Idol Maniacs? I, for, it, I always, I always forget. But that basically is an expansion. I would consider that to be an expansion to Side Pocket 2 in its own sense. It's pretty good. Pretty good in its own right. And then, of course, any other titles that they made along the way. Again, a whole bunch of other pool games had, again, had Side Pocket 2 never been made, I don't think that this ever, I don't think that um, the franchise, the, the, the simulation pool franchise would have kicked off in the way it did. I don't think it would have gotten as notable or as popular or as easy to play as it is thanks to Data East. So I really do feel bad that, you know, Data East kind of doesn't really exist much anymore and that we don't really have the luxury of having good pool games to mess around with. These were some of the best of their time, and they still are some of the best today. Even, you know, 21 to 30 years later. Remember, the, remember, the first Side Pocket came out in 1986. And the fact that it's still being talked about by me, by other people out there nowadays, that's got to tell you something. That's got to tell you exactly how good this series was back then and how it still is now. And this comes from somebody that only started really playing the series in 2015. Don't get me wrong, I've always known of these games, I've known of these games for years, but I never, I never had the luxury of getting them because nobody in my area had them, nor were they properly sold around here anymore. At least after the late 90s. You know, we no longer have Funko Land, we don't have EB Games, you know, all modern air, all modern renditions of GameStop, unless you're looking online, um, don't have any uh, anything from older consoles. Only stuff from generations seven and eight. And from the looks of things, um, I don't know when the um, I don't know officially when the PlayStation Three and Three Hundred and Sixty will fully discontinue everything. Unless if they've already been discontinued. I mean, some. I mean, I think in New Zealand the PlayStation 3 has already been discontinued. I have to double check my sources on that though. But you know, I'm still. But you know, I'm still seeing games being sold, and eventually it'll probably just end up having to be all online. And then eventually, of course, you know, we're gonna have um, emulation for it. I mean, we're already seeing emulation for the 360 by means of Xenia. And, you know, Xenia is still in a very experimental, use-at-your-own-risk kind of condition. But, you know, it's still kind of, it's still kind of nice to see that, th that these particular consoles, with such obscure hardware, mind you, are finally getting, you know, the emulation treatment. But, 
I don't know how long it's going to take for those to really get optimized, especially because in the case of the PlayStation 3 anyway, which had unique hardware, yeah, and because most of their games ran on either 25 or 50 gigabyte Blu-ray discs, size and yeah, size and data consumption is going to be a problem. I know that for a fact. It's kind of like the matter that we currently have with the Sega Saturn library, actually, because the Sega Saturn and Dreamcast libraries um, together, I think, make up, a, I want to say, a few terabytes of data. I think you need like one and a half terabytes of data just to even store every single Sega Saturn game. That also goes for all the um, the titles that haven't been released yet, including um, including Hyam Waltz. Um, Eiffel Home Oregon and Basic, including um, Data Soba Deluxe. The three rarest games in the Saturn Library, which have not been publicly archived on the Internet Archive website or anywhere else, to my knowledge, for that matter. More or less because I think combined, only about 150 of those, um, all in terms of copies, were ever made. I think it was about 100 for High and Waltz, 50 for Eiffel Home, Oregon, and Basic, and like 1 to 4 copies of Data Sova Deluxe. There's footage of Data Sova Deluxe, but in terms of the infotainment, um, the, the, the other two, which are infotainment games, was basically show you real estate. Yes, the real estate infotainment games for the Japanese Saturn. I don't know if we'll ever see those come, in t come into the spotlight ever again. It would be surprising if we ever did, but I just don't know. I just honestly don't know. I can't be sure. Couldn't be sure for you. Can I top this one? Hmm. Oh, she got that really. She got that relatively close, but it would have banked. It would have banked if it hit. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna pocket the two, and for good reason. Oh, excuse me. Had tea earlier. Had tea earlier with some lovely rice and a really odd thing of stuffing. Stuffing is good when done right, but ugh. I mean, don't get me wrong. It, it gave me an odd taste. It felt weird. Felt weird? I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not bad. Stuffing is not bad, but it can taste weird depending on what ingredients you put in it. This one had tomato in it. And I mean heavily baked tomato. It's the only way I can eat it. Other than that, it'll make my throat itch. I've mentioned this on plentiful occasions, but if you ever hear my throat itch, it's like... <coughs> kind of sounds like a pig snorting, right? <coughs> but that just means that, um, like, somewhere near the beginning of my throat has irritation. And that just needs to be, um, cleaned, so to speak. It usually happens when I have fruit when it's not baked. It also happens if I eat unbaked or uncooked um, uh, certain variants of vegetables. Like, if you d don't try to give me dry carrots. I'm not going to eat it. Don't try to give me apples or bananas without baking it thoroughly. I'm not going to eat it. In fact, I won't eat bananas anyway because... Regardless of how they are, they make my throat itch. I just can't have them. But I can have plantains perfectly. I can't eat um, I can't eat ripe tomato, ripe or even regular tomatoes unless if it's baked or turned into a sauce or ketchup. <laughs> That's why you never see me eat fruits and vegetables as much as I would probably like to. I mean, I mean, heck, nowadays I'm mostly just grains and meat. I'm a grains and meat kind of guy. And it's just because of all these allergies I had way back when. I mean, these are things I've had since I was a kid, though. It's not, it's nothing out of it's nothing out of the ordinary for me. But I'm sure that if some of you ended up getting that um, completely out of the blue, I'm sure that you'd be flipping your fish. You wouldn't know what to do. And you know, I kind of would feel bad for you if you ever had to go through such allergies, such as what I've had to go through. So that's kind of why, in my regard, some might render me as a picky eater. But it's not because of anything that sounds too far-fetched. It's just because of my own personal experiences with certain foods that I cannot consume for one reason or another, based on health from the past.
Is that kind of sad? Again, I'm sure I'm not pro. I'm sure I'm probably not the only person that does the that, that talks about this kind of stuff and that has these problems. I'm sure that some of you that watch this have similar factors. You know, if you do, I you know if I if you do, I you have my sympathy. You definitely do have my sympathy if you've got like bad allergies that you've had for a long time, um, in, in, including like if you have like food allergies of food that you actually want to eat. Either to get healthier or to, or that you just simply enjoy. That would be like um, I don't know, like somebody that that enjoys the taste of peanut butter, but because they have a peanut allergy, when they eat peanut butter, their face swells up so badly. I I I, I, I can't fathom what goes through their minds, or or at least. Or at least what goes through their emotions when they know that they can't have it due to allergies, or even just, or even just smelling it, can cause them to get sick. That it, I don't know what to say about that. It just I don't know. I don't know. That's not an easy way for anybody to live. That's all I have to really say on that. If only there were an easy way to eat anything without having allergies in that form. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that people would probably say, why don't, why don't some people eat tofu or something, you know? That sounds more reasonable, that sounds more logical. Tofu's good. Tofu's good, you can do a lot of things with tofu. You can cook it in any fashionable way that you want. And it doesn't, and it doesn't seem as if it delivers a bad aftertaste or or any kind of like bad side effects. I mean, heck, um, the only time I ever had tofu was in July of 2005. Uh, I, the only reason why I remember this was because uh, this was at Home Base 3, uh, the 1996 house. And uh, this was while I was in Mat the Mattapan region of Boston. Uh, I guess that somebody in the house decided like, hey, I want to try out some tofu. I want to see what I can make with this. Um, I don't, you know, if you try to have tofu just stand alone, it tastes weird. You have to cook it with stuff. You gotta cook it with seasoning, you gotta cook it with meat, you gotta cook it with grains, you gotta cook it with something. But once you get the hang of it, once you get the hang of how it tastes and how it works with your body, you know, you probably would be able to eat certain things without the need of having to worry about others. So, like, you know, if if you can make like um, like beef out of tofu, you won't ever have to worry about eating beef regularly if you're a vegetarian or a vegan. If you are somebody that can't eat um, certain, f <laughs> you know, I'm actually kind of curious if you can make fruit tofu. <laughs> yeah, that that could actually remedy my factor with um, with fruit altogether. Then again, um, there's also another thing that I feel that also needs to be invested more into and that is stem cell research because you see foods that are made from stem cells um, y you know for the longest time we've always had an ongoing gag in TV shows and in the news where um, or you know stem cell stem cell research isn't properly funded and we've seen issues where, you know, we've seen episodes of, like, even Family Guy. I, I think I talked about this episode before. The episode known as Mixed Stroke. You know, Peter ends up losing his mustache. He grew a mustache and lost it at the McBurger town uh, when, it went on, when it went into a fire. Uh, the manager of that place ended up giving him a limitless supply of burgers. He ended up having a stroke from it. Went into a stem cell research lab. And then what ends up happening is he, he he goes out of the place. He talks to the talks to the guard outside. He's like, "How long was I in there for?" Uh, this is about five minutes. Why are we not funding this? <laughs> yeah, his body was fully restored in about five minutes due to stem cells, which makes me wonder if stem cells truly can heal the body that well and that quickly. Why are we not funding it? Why is it not as funded as it deserves to be? 
Because, you know, eventually, you know, we might see stem cell fruits. And by 2030, or even 2036, according to recent reports, there, there is a significant chance that we will start seeing the first stem cell burgers being served in our local and international restaurants. Again, stem cell research is not as far-fetched as it might sound. It will probably become the method of the future. We might be using it in medical practices. We will be using it in foods. We'll be seeing it in our drinks. We'll probably be seeing it with... Um, we'll be seeing it with a lot of things. Not, not Probably not just for those kind of things, but also for... Um, Probably for the way that material in um, metal is made, or the way that, or the way that vehicles are made, or even energy. Anything can happen. Anything at all can happen. So I do want to. I, I hope that we will continue to see stem cell research uh, excel in quality, and also in what it does, because there's just so much that can and will happen. It's only a matter of time before it just becomes, you know, mainstream. It's not a radical idea. Might be right now to some people, but if but it eventually will be the standard normal, will be the modern status quo. So do not be surprised. We will be seeing that within this timeline. All that I hope is that people will be ready for that change when the time comes. Okay, it looks like I pocketed both the 9 and the 4. Oh yeah, I totally forgot. Um, if you scratch the ball in this game... Um, yeah, now as you know, this game works... Uh, single pocket works on a point system. Totally forgot to mention this. So the point system in this game, as you know, runs on a, runs on a simple method here. You have... You, you have to get 8 points. But if you scratch the ball, you lose a point. And not only that, when you lose a point, that means that another ball comes back on the table. So you better be sure to always hit a ball whenever you play this. It doesn't matter if you don't sink in the ball. Just so long as you hit it, you'll, ha you'll still have a chance at staying alive. You won't have to worry about losing your points that quickly. I've had that instance happen to me before. I, uh, I at one time, um, lost a seven-point lead. I had a seven and zero lead, seven and zero lead, and just wasted it because of the fact that I just took too much time. It took too much time going through. I, I took too much time to screw it up on and trying to get that last ball, but I kept I kept um, putting it in a pocket. It's a bad time. Bad, bad time. Heck, at least it's not as bad as when I accidentally, um... I mean, I, I mean... I mean, I had my anus handed to me in that one episode of, um... In that one episode of Royman Alive. I think it was, um... Ep episode 11? In episode... If you don't know what I'm talking about, um... Royman Alive is covered on the Twitch channel. Uh, um, episodes will eventually be archived sooner or later to this channel, but I don't know when that'll be. But uh, it, but in that episode in particular that I'm talking about, I I did Super Casino 2, which was a Japanese Super Famicom exclusive, where you have to get a, a I think it's a million dollars in order to um, complete the entire game. Plays in the same fashion as Caesar's Palace, but nowhere near as fast. Although in that game you could also go up to, although in that game you can go up to nine million and then and then the game's over. But in terms of um, but in terms of the second half of that, I went and played um, Side Pocket 2 MD. I played Minnesota Fats Pool Legend. I did the free play mode and I lost in every single multiplayer matchup that I did. I mean multiplayer matchup. Every free play mode matchup that I did. That was a sad day for me. That was a very, very sad day, and that, that was actually, I think, after recording this, you know, recording this footage here. So, 
that, that, that was just, that, that was kind of embarrassing for me. <laughs> I'm at least fortunate that not a lot of people saw that episode, but it'll be uploaded to this channel eventually. You'll see how horrible, uh, how horribly I failed. That was just not, that was just not my day. Not my day. Not one bit. So what am I gonna do here? Yeah, but I got a chance to pocket the 12. Uh, but I need the curve, so I'm gonna do Mate 2, knocking the 12 and it knocks the 8 and the 4. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. So I'm gonna have to angle the 10 away. Uh, can I do this? Let's see what I do here. So Mate 2, I pocket whatever ball was hanging out down there. What was that? Alright, a 15. Yep, no need to rush. That's true. That's true, Miss Susan. We're already about 25 minutes and 53 seconds into this commentary. We could just, I mean, we could just take our time. Again, a single pocket. A single pocket. We could be here all day playing. Can I top this one? Hmm. Let's see. That was a bad shot, Susan. But she wanted to make sure that I didn't have a clear-cut shot of getting um, any balls that were in my path, because I, because I easily could have sucked in the ten if I knew what I was doing. But yep, that is the easiest I can get right now. That's the easiest I can get to dealing with the ten, unless if Susan decides to knock all the balls away, which is what is probably going to happen. I'm looking at her sprite, her um, her facial sprite here. Only part of her face actually has red lipstick. Only a part of her mouth, only a part of her lips have red lipstick. It's like the whole dead center of it is brown. That's a weird design. The only person I know who uses um, brown lipstick, at least officially, is um, is Terry Hatcher. Because if you watch Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, uh, you'll know that Terry Hatcher, as Lois Lane, always has brown lipstick. I don't know, I guess it was just a thing with her. She loves, she loves brown lipstick. Heck, Dean Kane, I think, also wears like some kind of lip gloss or some kind of lipstick in Season 3. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about if you watch the series. Just pay close attention to Dean Kane's lips while, while he's talking in certain scenes, depending on the room he's in. Um, it usually happens while either at Lois's house or at Clark's house, but <laughs> you'll see right off the bat what I'm talking about. I, I mean, his lips look too shiny. It's like either he has lipstick or lip gloss on. I don't know, maybe it was, maybe they were chapped and he had to have something on, but who knows, I don't know. I can't be sure. <laughs> I don't know how um, December 3rd Productions, I don't know how Warner Brothers Television handled the show at the time, but, you know, it, yeah, it was, it, it, for what it's worth, it's a pretty good series. Do I feel that it could have, do I feel that every one of those episodes, however, could have been a feature film? Oh, absolutely. In fact, the series premiere, the pilot episode of Lois and Clark, is literally just a Superman film, if you watch it uncut. You could have you could have put that in the theaters, and I would have gone to watch it. <laughs> you could have put, like, all the major episodes into a, um, like, like, uh, uh, there's a scene going into, um, seasons, uh, I think it's three to four, or it's two to three, in which, you know, um... Or maybe it was in season three. Simply put, there's an, there's a cloning saga in um in a certain portion of episodes in Lois and Clark that involves Lex Luthor basically making a fake Lois, meaning that um meaning that Clark married a fake Lois, and from there you know Clark finds out that the clone exists. And it's up to them to take down Lex Luthor, but um, later on, um, Lois loses her memory. And she loses it twice. And at the very end, like parts four and five, she's just trying to um, 
regain her memory, but at the same time also um, make sure that she's no longer in the hands of a certain Lex Luthor looking uh, doctor. And that's, that's basically how that one went. But that was a five part storyline that aired by the week. Or that aired by the months going into the week because uh, I, I guess the way that it was aired was just in some really odd broadcasting format. But all those five parts together, which I think totals well over two hours and 45 minutes of footage, that could have just been um, Lois and Clark the movie. You could have made that a feature film and I would have went to see it. But who cares about that right now? We just beat the US Championship Tournament for a single pocket. Ugh. Never again. That was a... Ugh. I don't know what to say about that. That was a really bad, and I mean bad, um, episode in terms of um, how long that went. I did not expect this to... I mean, altogether, the, 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 the single pocket portion of this commentary is over, I want to say, one and a half, two hours long. Now do you understand why this take why this takes so long for me to do sometimes? This is very hard work. And bear in mind, we are now roughly I want to say let's see. Um the whole video itself is um well at least the whole raw itself is 1,071,763 frames. At the time of this we're a little over 792,600 or over 792 and a half thousand. We're more than two-thirds done with this. We're about 70-71% done, or maybe a little more than that. But still, at least the worst is out of the way. That is the longest part of the commentary. Everything will go quicker from here. So we'll be back with part six when we finish up tournament mode and become the undisputed champion in, one of, in what is considerably one of the best games in this rotation.